Roddy Rodiger, our next speaker, has spent his career understanding the very things that we are talking about today. He studies human learning and memory and is famous in psychology for his demonstrations, which are in every textbook, of the startling ways in which memories can be disrupted, how retrieval can fail, and thankfully also how to improve memory. He is James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor at Washington University. As an example of how teachers come in many guises, I remember a young assistant professor, Roddy Rodiger, sitting in the audience year after year when I, an uncertain graduate student, gave my first talks at conferences. By asking me hard questions and engaging with me, Roddy played a role in my own development as a scientist. I'm particularly happy to see him here at Harvard. Welcome, Roddy. Thank you very much, Mazarin. Uh, it's wonderful to be here on this occasion, and um, this wonderful gift the Housers have given to start this new initiative. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here to help inaugurate the event. I will say just at the outset that my speech is a little bit different. Uh, I had surgery on my mouth and tongue a few years ago, so I hope everything will be clear, but uh, that is why it's a little bit off. Uh, what I want to do today is talk about, uh, Carl gave a wonderful introduction. Uh, I am a cognitive psychologist. I have spent the last seven or eight years of my life uh, turning my attention to how we can take what we have learned in the cognitive psychology lab and apply it to learning and teaching. Uh, I have also, the research I have done has totally changed the way I teach, uh, and so I uh, will recommend it. Uh, and try to just give you a snippet of some of the things we've tried to do in the lab. Uh, we, my, my basic approach is to start with laboratory experiments with very simple materials, uh, usually using college students as our uh, participants or our subjects. College students are the Drosophila of learning and memory research in my field. We, we work out the laws with college students and hope they apply elsewhere. Uh, and then we try to scale up. We can go from simple materials to much more complex materials, uh, more like realistic text materials. Uh, the, those two stages are pretty clear. The really tricky part is the part that Carl just talked about so elegantly. How do you really take these things into the classroom and show they work? That many educational innovations uh, may or may not really be effective. You have to take them into the classroom or into student learning and show they are better. You can have an innovation that's actually worse than your standard practice, and until you figure that out, you uh, can't claim to have made an improvement. And then finally, we also talk to students a lot uh, when they're in our experiments or when they're in our classes, and we ask them about their learning, and we get ideas for future research, which then feeds back into the laboratory. Uh, so what I want to do is to start off and just tell you about one of my little adventures in doing this kind of research, where we take something we found in the laboratory and we extend it to the classroom. Now, uh, one of the things we did was we asked students, uh, this survey has been done at a number of different universities now, but just to give you kind of the upshot, suppose you have, ask students, suppose you have a big test coming up in your physics class or your psychology class or your history class in a few weeks. What are the techniques that you use to learn and study for the, uh, for the test? And here are some of the, uh, the, the top two there, the ones that are most frequently uh, said, that what they do is they read their textbook, they highlight or underline, then they reread their textbook, the highlighted and underlined parts. They also talk about some other strategies. The top two are the most frequent. Uh, they also talk about reviewing and rewriting notes uh, some people say they use conscious strategies to memorize. Uh, uh, some say they outline the material while they're reading the books. That's a good thing to do, better than the first two. Uh, and some say they like to study in study groups uh, with their friends. And there are various other things, too, but these are the main ones. So we think these activities lead to learning. We could add in lecturing, of course. Uh, and then we ask, well, how in academia do we measure learning? Well, we know that too. We don't have to give surveys. We give quizzes, we give tests, we give essays, we give exams. Uh, but relatively speaking, in higher education, uh, 
these are infrequent. There, it's not uncommon to say have a big introductory psychology course where you might have two tests during the semester and then a final exam. So say three assessments. Now what I want to suggest in my talk today is that really we need to focus on those bottom activities. That some of the best ways of enhancing learning or by quizzing, testing, having people write essays, and take exams. You learn a lot more from that than you do from rereading the material. Uh, but that's kind of an unusual idea, because usually in higher, there's kind of a conspiracy in higher education that uh, professors don't like to give tests, really. They really hate grading tests. Uh, and students don't like to take tests, so we don't give them very much. Uh, or at least I didn't used to, but now I do. Uh, and I'll show you why. Uh, the same assumption is built into the psychology of learning and memory. If you look back over, it's been going about 135 years now. If you look back over time, one of the time-honored ways of studying learning is have uh, people study some material, take a test on it, study it again, take a test on it, and so forth. You develop from this a learning curve. I'll show you some examples in a moment, but just a nice logarithmic curve showing performance going up. Uh, but the whole assumption in learning and memory research, we have lots of theories of learning, uh, and they all assume that the action occurs during studying. So people study something and they encode it into memory and they form memory traces, uh, and then those are exhibited on the test. But the tests are relatively neutral events and that the, uh, those neutral events don't much affect performance. So uh, let me show you a simple study that calls that into question. Uh, this was done with Franklin Jerome down on the bottom left. He uh, was a Harvard undergraduate, by the way, before he came to graduate school with me at Washington University. Uh, he was a religion major here, not a psychology major. Uh, but uh, as part of his dissertation work, uh, well, actually, this is before his dissertation work, but it led into it, uh, we just did a very straightforward experiment that psychologists are fond of doing. The first uh, wrote, we had people learning 50-word lists. Uh, their tests were what are called free recall. People just got a blank sheet of paper, or these days, a blank computer screen, and they type in what they know. Uh, and then we gave them a test two days later on what they could remember. And so if you see that first row, they just took, this is what psychologists usually do, study the material, test on it, study, test on it, and so forth. Now, if we assume that study, study trials are good for learning and test trials are just neutral uh, assessments, uh, what we decided to do was to drop out some of the tests and add the study trials. So you can see in the second row, we dropped out two of the tests, and the, for this group of people, uh, they studied the material six times and took only two tests. And then for the bottom row, they studied the word list eight times and didn't take any tests. And we measured performance during the first day. I won't show you that. Uh, but then we brought them back um, two days later to see what they, they thought they were coming for new experiments, which they were, but we also asked um, what would uh, the effect now of the increasing the number of study opportunities have on performance. And the results are in the next slide. Whoops, pushed the wrong thing. Um, and what we see is you increase the number of study opportunities from four to six to eight, you decrease recall from 39% to 25% to 17%. Kind of an astounding conclusion. The, is it really the case that the more you study, the less you learn? <laughs> uh, well, no, that's not the conclusion at all, because what we did in this experiment was we, if you go back, uh, we deliberately confounded the number of study opportunities with the number of test opportunities. So there were either zero, two, or four tests. So what this really tells you, if you transpose these data and, and you plot them as a function of the number of tests, is that what determines performance two days later is how many tests they had on the first day. That having four study trials and four tests is a whole lot better, more than twice as good to have that schedule than to simply have uh, eight study opportunities. So although we have the number of study opportunities, we greatly improve performance two days later. Why? Well, the simple interpretation is, what do you really need to practice to be able to retrieve something two days later? Well, you need to practice retrieving it. If you've studied something over and over, like students tend to do, they read the text over and over, uh, but you've never practiced retrieving it, you've never used the material, you've never pulled it out of memory, 
Well, you're not going to be very effective at doing that later uh, when you're given a test. So uh, practicing retrieval has a huge benefit on later performance. William James, my other Harvard tidbit in this, uh, wrote this in his Principles of Psychology textbook. He said, a curious peculiarity of our memory if we're trying to learn something, say, by heart, is that when we almost know the piece, it pays better to wait and recollect from the effort within than to look at the book again. If we try to recover the words in the former way, we shall probably know them later on. Uh, if in the latter way, we shall probably need to look at the book once more. Uh, he stated this very authoritatively. There was absolutely no evidence for it at the time he wrote these words, but, <laughs> but he was still right, uh, <laughs> as he was in much of his book. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful two-volume book that uh, I assume many of you knew. He wrote it while he was a professor here, of course. Um, so uh, what I've just told you about is what in cognitive psychology is called the testing effect or the retrieval practice effect. And uh, what we have shown in many studies, not just me, but many other people in the field, is that taking a test on something is a very effective way to learn about it. And it's as though, uh, if you go to a medical school bookstore here, uh, you will see dozens and dozens of sets of flashcards that people use to learn material uh, as a way of self-testing, the same way you learn your multiplication tables, probably, having... Uh, six times four on one side and 24 on the other, and you practice them over and over. Um, and I want to talk about, uh, essentially, the, the version of flashcards for just a moment, uh, because psychologists use, as I've just shown you, this repeated study and test procedure, where you study a set of material, you test on it, you study it again, you test on it. And it's a pretty inefficient and cumbersome way of doing things. And so uh, if you look at, I've bought a lot of the flashcard sets and I always read the instructions and they always say, you should use a dropout method. You should study material until you can retrieve it and then you should drop that material from your, your study efforts because you already know it and you should turn yourself to uh, concentrate on the material you don't know. Sort of study something until you can retrieve it, then drop it, study the stuff that's harder and that you don't know. So, um, uh, and, and there is evidence for this. I'll show you some more right now that this isn't a terrible thing to do in a way. Um, but it has a, a downside too that I'll show you. So we, we did an experiment, we in this case, uh, uh, graduate student Jeff Karpicki uh, and I, who he's now an assistant professor at Purdue. Uh, but um, we had, we compared people, again, learning word lists. I'm going to get to something besides word lists in a moment. Uh, but we had people study uh, 40 words, and they uh, studied either the standard way, they studied all 40, tested on all 40, studied all 40, tested on all 40, over eight trials, or we used a dropout procedure. Uh, the dropout procedure, once they recalled the word, they didn't study it anymore, and they weren't tested on it anymore. So basically, the 40-word list just got shorter and shorter, there was always a mi uh, half minute delay between the study and test, so they couldn't just retrieve from short term memory. But if you look at learning here, uh, it's quite clear, this is why everybody recommends the dropout procedure. Learning is faster, it's more efficient, and you get, they got to 100%, they got to, so they retrieved all of the words by the end of the procedure. So that looks terrific. But what Jeff and I did, which is done in almost no other experiments, is we brought them back uh, later, I think it was two days later in this experiment, uh, uh, to test them again. And we wanted to ask, well, does the dropout procedure hold up over time? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Actually, the standard method, the repeated laborious studying and testing and studying and testing everything, two days later, uh, produced performance that was twice as good as the dropout method. So if you look at the forgetting from the initial end of learning to the uh, test, people forgot twice as much in the dropout method as they did in the standard laborious study and test on everything method. Um, and so uh, what this 
pattern of results shows, we see it fairly frequently in cognitive psychology, that what determines, uh, what makes original learning fast can also make you lose it quickly. But what we see as teachers in the classroom quite often is how quickly our students are learning. We give them pretty immediate tests. We don't worry about what they're going to know in six months or two days even. Uh, and so you can be fooled. You can have this, you can use a study technique like the dropout method that seems efficient and wonderful and brings you up quickly to criterion, but it doesn't hold uh, water in the long run. And uh, at Robert Bjork, a psychologist at UCLA, has coined the term that learning often needs to have desirable difficulties. Coming back to what Carl said, he said learning often needs to be difficult. You need to be challenged. Um, and what this, uh, by desirable difficulties, what he means is that something that, uh, a variable that will slow down initial learning often has long-term benefits. It's somewhat counterintuitive, because normally you think of something that makes learning fast and facile and easy, that should benefit us in the long term too. But often it doesn't. If you, make, if you slow learning down, you make it more challenging, you get better long-term retention. So that's the uh, idea of desirable, introducing desirable difficulties in learning. Now, not all difficulties are desirable difficulties, and we're trying to figure out when something's desirable, because some difficulties just make everything bad. Uh, using a lot of jargon, would, like Carl said, would probably be an example of that. We can ask, well, what is it? Uh, so everybody likes this dropout method. What is it about uh, the dropout method that made it so much worse than the standard method? And there are two differences, of course. When you drop things out, you don't study them anymore, and you don't test yourself on them anymore um, compared to the standard method. So you could imagine, well, it's the, either the increased study opportunities that benefit people, or it's the increased test opportunities, or conceivably the thing I thought when we went into this research was it's both. I mean, studying's got to be important. You can't learn anything without studying it somewhat. Uh, but we thought testing would be important too. Uh, but again, Jeff Kropicki and I did a study where we asked people learning foreign language vocabulary. Uh, we picked Swahili English word pairs. Swahili is a good language to use because our undergraduates don't come in knowing anything about it by and large. Uh, and uh, also the words look like uh, they're pronounceable English non-words. They look like they, they're not a difficult orthography or phonology to learn. So we have them with Mashua boat, laser scarf, and so forth. And we compared the standard method and the dropout method in learning these. There were 40 pairs. And we gave them four trials. And then we introduced two new conditions. Uh, and here they are. Uh, so the, the top one here is the standard way psychologists like to do things. Remember, there are 40 words, there are four, four trials. So in this top case, everybody studied and everybody retrieved everything. So there are 160 study events, 160 test events. The bottom is the dropout case. As soon as they recall something, they never studied it again, and they're never tested on it again. And as it worked out, it took about half as, they got about half as many trials. Uh, and so, again, we're trying to ask, well, what is it that makes the dropout method worse for long-term retention? And the two intermediate conditions, we asked that. Uh, so in one, what we, we did selectively, we selectively dropped items out. We either, once they recall something correctly, if they got uh, scarf when they saw laser, then we uh, either dropped it out so they never were tested on it again. That's the second line. So they still got 160 study trials, but now they only got about half as many test trials. And in the third line, we dropped it out of studying. They never studied it again, but we kept testing them on it. And once they got it once, they could almost always get it again with these materials. So now they had uh, uh, fewer study trials, but more test trials. And so then we waited a week and brought them back and asked, well, what did they know after a week? Uh, and the results were quite simple and, and somewhat stunning to us. Uh, the brief version is repeated studying. After you've learned something once, repeated studying didn't matter at all. Uh, if you look at the two bars on the right, uh, this group studied and were tested. Uh, that's the 320 times, 160 study, 160 uh, tests. This is the group that we dropped things out of. They never studied them again after they got it, uh, but we kept testing them. 
the two groups on the left are the ones that were only tested long enough to get it once, and then we stopped testing them. And you can see that what determines performance a week later is the amount of testing that we did on the first day, not the amount of studying. That this group had uh, many more study trials than this group, and yet performance is only 3%, non-significantly better. Uh, the two in intermediate ones are those two new conditions. Notice they're the same, rough same, the same number of trials overall, but the ones that got many test trials remembered better. Repeated retrieval was the key to retention for these. So the standard dropout method simply doesn't work. It works great for short-term retention, but it works badly for long-term retention. Finally, to tell you one last thing, we I'm not going to be able to tell you about all the classroom experiments we've done. We've done maybe 20 of them now. But just to tell you that this does scale up both to complex materials and to the classroom, we had study, uh, people, before we took this into the classroom, we had them study uh, passages, 250-word passages from textbooks on a variety of topics, some on science, some on, one was on Louis Armstrong, one was on sea otters, and so forth. And we had people do what students say they normally do, namely repeatedly study things, or we had them study them so four times, we had them study them three times and take a test, or we had them study them only once and take three tests. And um, we asked the students to make a rating at the end of the study, at the end of this first day, we said, we're going to bring you back in a week and we're going to test you on these passages you've learned. How well do you think you'll do? And they just made a judgment on a one to seven scale uh, on how well they thought they could do in a week later. Um, and the first thing to show you is what their judgments were. If they'd studied the stuff over and over, they thought they would do great. They were sick of this passage. They'd read about Galileo four times now, and they weren't going to forget what Galileo did. Uh, the other two cases, once they took a test, they were said, ooh, this is kind of hard. Maybe I didn't know this quite as well as I did, either because they didn't study it as much or because taking the test brought their judgments down. So they're predicting how they'll do a week later. So how they actually do a week later, how these three conditions compare, exactly the opposite to the way the students predicted they would do. If they studied four times but didn't take any tests on the first day, they remembered the material pretty dismally. Simply repeatedly reading stuff, remember that's the student's main study strategy is what they tell us, uh, that led them to think they really knew the stuff, but they didn't uh, when you test them a week later. Whereas the other two cases where we gave them tests, the t act of taking the test, the act of retrieving the passages, helps to consolidate the information and helps them to make it retrievable later on. Uh, what were they actually predicting? Well, here's how they did, if we just tested them five minutes after the original learning, it was right. They were right. They were predicting how, what they knew right then. They simply couldn't project forward to know how they would do in the future. So if we tested them after only five minutes, the people who studied it massively did fine. That's cramming. We did show cramming works. If you read something over and over and then take a test on it, you do pretty well. But you forget it right away. Uh, or at least over a week. Um, so you can see uh, how performance flip-flops over the course of the week. And again, an example of desirable difficulty. What works well for the short term doesn't necessarily work well for the long term. To conclude, we've what I've shown you obviously is that uh, repeated retrieval as you do through self-testing uh, greatly improves performance. And we have been doing research. We have a grant from the Department of Education to research in a middle school uh, close to St. Louis. Uh, we've done a lot of work there. And we've also done work in university classrooms and so have a lot of other people around the country now trying to do this in a rigorous way where you can really evaluate it. Um, and we've done it in, in those subjects mentioned. I also have a project going uh, uh, with a physician named Doug Larson uh, in uh, our pediatric uh, neurology unit at Washington University. Now, uh, I've told you about one benefit of testing, this active retrieval part. Uh, there are actually, I'm going to spare you the other nine, but actually there are lots of other reasons uh, that, that frequent quizzing in classes, I'm not talking about high stakes tests now, I'm talking about frequent uh, quizzing in classes can help benefit students and teachers in many other ways. And this is from a chapter that's on my website that was published last year, but I 
clearly won't take time to talk about that. You'll be happy to know. But there are some other reasons for doing this, too. Uh, so thank you for your attention, and thanks to the uh, funders, James McDonald Foundation, and the others for supporting this work. Thank you. Thank you.